huge family in New York, so I tend to be a little loud and talk really fast, so let me know. Um, so good afternoon. I'm Susan Alexander, as Natasha said, and she has entrusted me today with facilitating this conversation, which is an incredibly important part of, of what um, CAV is all about. And, and this year is looking at the connection between compost and climate, and specifically we're going to talk a lot today about climate resiliency. So a um, couple of just housekeeping. Your phones are all on vibrate, right? Bathrooms, if you haven't been yet, I just went. End of the hall to the, to the right and left. Um, we got plenty of exits, and I think that's all you need to really know. Um, this session is being recorded, right? OK, that's the other thing. So it's all being recorded. Um, so we're going to have questions. We'll have to come to the microphone, like this is what you did this morning, nothing new there. And then um, we do have a great panel here, and they're going to watch some of the slides, and then they'll be up here um, so that they can see the slides as well. But then they'll come up for Q&A at the end. Um, I think that's about it. I know I'm standing between, like, everyone's blood sugar has just dropped after lunch, and you're thinking, Prohibition pig, is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, so with that said, we'll keep going. Onward. Um, so what, one of the things I do in my free time is I manage the Lamoille Solid Waste um, composting facility, Lamoille Soil. And um, we built this incredibly lovely food scrap composting facility in Johnson because, as you heard this morning, the Agency of Natural Resources is in, engaged in, in monitoring and, and enforcing land uh, food scrap bans from the landfill. So um, makes sense. There's a, you saw, I guess it was Jane put up the map this morning. Sorry, I got my back to some of you. That shows um, waste management is actually a pretty small contributor to the total greenhouse gas emission pie. But nonetheless, it's an important one, and probably the landfill being the largest, especially in Vermont, contributor to greenhouse gas uh, emissions from a waste viewpoint. So our charge is to remove those food scraps, turn them into beautiful compost, and send it back into our local food system. Ironically, <laughs> maybe not ironically, but sort of, um, yeah, we're just talking about biosolids. So I'm kind of feeling down. I was thinking, I was, gonna, <laughs> I was going to brag about our great compost and challenge all the other composters in the room, because there are several of you, because we have this really, really great high quality. We don't take anything other than food scrap compost. Until I remembered this next part of my presentation here, what I was going to tell you about is that we built our composting facility on a former biosolids <laughs> composting pad. And it just occurred to me now, those forever chemicals are forever chemicals. And here we thought, oh, we have the best, cleanest compost in Vermont. And yet yeah, we're composting on former biosolids property. That is totally off script. It's just carryover from the last session. <laughs> um, anyway, you go back to like Nebra 30 years ago was really promoting the use of biosolids. Uh, the town of Johnson or the village of Johnson had a wastewater treatment plant. They wanted to compost their, their um, biosolids. They built this wonderful facility, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, they ran it for just a couple of years. And if you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different answers as to why it failed. But it sat there abandoned for about 20 years until the um, Act 148 and the requirement to start separating out our food scraps, at which point we got some grant money, we put together a great program, we hired a wonderful manager, and um, you know we, we do challenge out there for all of you. We do make the best compost in Vermont. Uh, anyway, um, that said, you know we've learned a lot in 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 the years since Johnson closed their, their biosolids composting facility and learned a lot more earlier today, which is still going around in the back of my head. Um, 
but the, the basic premise of, of keeping organics um, out of the landfill and, and putting them to the best and highest use possible, the premise is still there. And, you know, we heard a lot about what's going on in the state of Maine. Kudos to whoever was giving us the, all that information earlier about paving the way for other states. Um, but that premise is still there, and compost, I think we can all agree, is one of the best things that we can do to improve our soil health, right? So when you're talking about increased crop yields, we're talking about drought resistance, we're talking about disease suppression, um, you know, uh, absorbing moisture, moisture holding capacity, um, mitigating um, erosion and runoff issues. So um, what all those things are great, and all those things do contribute to soil health. And then the next thing to connect that with is that your improvements that you're making by adding compost to your soil are also creating opportunities for climate resiliency, right? So these same attributes that compost have has for improving soil quality also really connect with um, climate resilience. And think about what would happen if we had a lot more organic matter in all of our soils. Um, so you're gonna hear from a great cadre of, of presenters today. We got some really talented people. Um, and while we're having, listening to their very rapid fire presentations, I think we wanna keep in back of our minds questions that we wanna ask them, such as, you know, how are we in Vermont connecting composting practices with climate resiliency? I don't think we've done a lot of that. Um, to date and think about what it would look like if we suddenly could add um, to every acre of cropland in the state, add more compost. Um, where are we going to get all that compost from in the first place? Who's going to make it? Who's going to pay for it? Who should be paying for it? Should we be getting paid to make compost? Should we get, be getting paid to use compost? Right? Those, those are questions that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, so if we just take the next like 85 minutes, I'm going to try and be good on timing, um, to explore some of these possibilities and opportunities, go deep, go wide, ask whatever questions, don't be afraid. Um, if you're thinking it, obviously somebody else is thinking it, and if not, then you're, you're a genius, okay? Um, but um, I think we also want to think about what we've learned earlier today and what we're going to go forward with is how do we connect this conversation today with conversations that are happening in other areas around the state. Um, the Office of Climate that talked this morning, the, um, uh, Jane, thank you, Jane Lazershack. Um, you know, they're, they're doing some good data collection and they need to hear from us. So how do, how do what we discuss and come away with today feed into what this re relatively new state agency is working towards? Um, you know, the Agency of Natural Resources also, um, in, in addition to the Office of Climate, houses the Solid Waste Division. And this isn't just about food scraps, but they are also he heavily involved in the composting world, um, as is the Agency of Agriculture um, for composting on farms. The Farm to Plate program that um, some of us are involved in is the Soil, Climate, and Environment Group. They're looking at how we might imagine filling in some of the gaps in the Climate Action Plan. Um, you know, there's organizations like Rural Vermont and Climate Farmers. Everybody's having this conversation at different levels. So how do we start pulling some of these threads and weaving them in together so we have a really good, tight um, quilt of, of programs, information, and policies that um, help us with the promoting compost and, and as a secret weapon in climate resiliency. So um, we have, as I said, some great panelists here today. I'm not going to read all their bios. I mean, some of their CVs are as long as my arms. So know that they're all really very talented. And we curated a very highly skilled group of people here. And their bios are all online and in the program. Um, they can introduce themselves. We're going to just kind of rapidly go through five, six minutes each. And then um, it will be an interactive event, right? So at the end, I, I want everybody to ask questions. Only ask questions in the interim if it's something that you need to clarify or if you didn't hear something correctly, we'll allow that. But last session I went in, we asked one question, I did, and it went for like half the session. So we want to get everybody's voices heard today. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Brian Jarose to be our first, oh, I'm sorry, not Brian. We're going to have Mari Omlin, who is a um, climate farmer 
and she's going to come up and she's going to do a great presentation. I'll tell you one thing I know about Mari. Every time I listen to her, I feel like I have to start training for a half marathon. She's really hard to keep up with. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. It's really great to be here. Um, together with my wife, Laura, we have Green Mountain Girls Farm in Northfield. And Laura and I see a future in which Vermont harnesses regenerative ag to support rural and ecological vitality. They say Vermont lost something like half its topsoil in the 1800s. 16 years ago, we purchased a farm that was largely overtaken with young succession forest with soil ranges um, pH from 4.7 to 5.3. Reports indicate Vermont and our agriculture will be important for the future of this country. Oh, what happened? I guess I gotta watch what I'm doing. Sorry about that, how did that, I don't know what I missed. Anyway, um, but we're gonna have to look at higher ground. Yet hill farms have always had trouble competing with the flat tra tractor terrain. Um, and before you see any of my photos, you have to know that we are a failing business. We may not be profitable, but we're creating wealth, breathing life back into this land. Compost, some of you made, has been key to this transformation. Our ideal is to keep plant canopy covering the soil, mimicking nature. Food from these plants is more nutritious. Gregariously photosynthesizing plants feed the soil via root exudates so that the soil biology can in turn thrive Feed the plants, especially micronutrients. By limiting soil disturbance, fungal connectivity, and microbial communities are thriving, cycling carbon and nutrients quickly and effectively. John Kemp gifted us all this plant health pyramid. Mainstream thinking focuses attention on amending soils to influence plant growth. Instead, this focuses attention on nourishing plants to feed the soil microbiome. Vibrant, biological, biologically active soils, high in organic matter, are capable of cycling carbon and nitrogen quickly, absorbing water so that big rain events can fall on our, so on our farm and have no runoff. We've purposely added enormous amounts of carbon and record increasing amounts of organic matter and fungal life. These emergent fungi are signaling that we've developed a fungally forward soil, something which we favor uh, since they're the best, uh, fungally, fungi are the best transporters of micronutrients. In the summer, these gals help us bless up the earth. Pigs and poultry have been especially important at renovating our land. 16 years ago, this spot had moss and lichen. We like what we see, good crumb structure, plants showing modest resistance to disease and pests. We have a lot to learn. We do see a deepening A horizon in our soils. In addition to your refined trucked in compost, we also make our own. All the Green Mountain girls, the hens, the ewes, the sows contribute. Our bedded pack system is ample enough to help us compost later in the season, our slaughter residuals, food, food scraps, and the rare mortality. My father-in-law wants to be composted, and we haven't dialed that in yet. <laughs> um, we chase after chip trucks, and we make rainmill chip with our own machines. It's our favorite mulch. Um, we remove the bedded pack each spring and renew it with a chip base. We tend to achieve adequate heat, um, but we haven't got a good system for continuous additions. We're working on that with Kat and Natasha. And when they were visiting our site, um, we built a new barn uh, 10 years back. At that point, we moved where we did our bedded pack. They looked at the site and they said, oh, you're not complying with wraps. <laughs> Laura and I are rule abiding folks. Um, we didn't mean to. We just pivoted. We set up the windrows, um, and it was too close to seasonal water that moves through our property just at this time of year. So Kat's scheme on the right is going to help us fix that. We're moving to the other side. Um, we want not to impact negatively our mountain streams and the watershed. Spreading our rustic compost together with our grazing practices has increased the diversity and life and depth of our soil. 
And the sand floor dries out, the new chip comes in, the barn is and the farmers clean up well enough to host our side hustle of agritourism. Purchased compost has been critical for all our starts, and that will remain. But we're cognizant that phosphorus buildup can happen with deep use of compost in gardens. So we've throttled back on compost additions, and we utilize these other practices um, to use less compost more strategically. We inoculate sort of our beds with dustings. We, in this case, this is bio-priming our seed, a compost, or a, a mixed cover crop on the left, um, and our um, garlic bean planted on the right. Another way is we use strategic additions, gist of compost, uh, in a, a no-till situation, just in spots for uh, putting in seeds um, and under-sowing. We also leave, separate from compost, we leave roots in the ground. We cut our weeds and we cut, um, leaving crop residuals in the field. Cover crops are, of course, part of the picture. Uh, these nodules confirm nitrogen fixation. Uh, both starting and terminating cover crops, of course, is impacted by weather. On the right day in summer, we can start the day with a vibrant uh, uh, cover crop in the morning. We can mow and solarize to terminate. Later that same day, we can plant out starts to begin growing in that same duff overnight. Uh, mulching is another piece of the equation. We collect, chop a lot of leaves. As I mentioned, ramiel chip is our favorite. In addition, we use uh, a lot of hay and straw. Another factor we all have to consider switching gears. There's a ubiquitous problem of compaction. We're experimenting with the innovative uh, rip sower, thanks to a seep grant. The rip sower basically is a chisel plow, and you can see those stripes, surgical stripes in the ground. The mechanical rip is kept open by an inoculated seed and biology that follows. Imagine to the right those, um, I'm not on the right one yet. Okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> I don't get out much. Anyway, um, you know, what will it mean in the future for Vermont when stripes of blooms cross all our pastures? What will it mean for our moods? What will it mean for our tourism? What will it mean if we have roots of these chicory flowers that go three feet deep, six feet deep, when the rest of humanity is eating from the top four or six inches of earth? Anyway, we also tap into sap analysis to understand the macro and micronutrients that are needed. We respond with foliar and fertigation sprays, some made with compost teas, again from some of you guys and gals. Anyway, compost helps us grow these trees, but sap sampling and targeted foliar nutrition is what's needed to make fruit and veggies grow like this without using even organically approved defenses. So we all started pivoting a lot, 2020, the pandemic, now the era of short staffing, and jumping words, worms. Thanks, Miriam and Penny, for your great presentation last. Anyway, these jumping worms absolutely enjoy the low-till, deep mulch system, and we've got a lot to learn. Farms produce more than food. Abundance, abundance abounds in our farm ecosystems. How farmers farm and eaters eat matters. A thousand years from now, when someone eats a chestnut from this tree planted with compost, one of you all made, will the people be, will, will pe what will they know about these before times when people chopped up food into smithereens and put it in plastic? Sheeps, once part of Vermont losing massive amounts of topsoil, are keystones in our practices on our farm to increase the life and depth of our soil. May we all get better at feeding each other. Thanks, Marie. That was a lot. That was 54 slides. She did that amazingly well. <laughs> and if you want to um, feed yourself better, I believe your farm store is opening tomorrow. It's true. It's true. Tomorrow or, or Wednesday. 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 There's a great place to feed yourself and food you can be proud of eating, so thank you. We're just gonna switch uh, PowerPoint slides here, so. Is this the next one? No. Sorry, no. You can close that right out. 
USCC Alexander. No, nope. no, nope, there should be. Where's the? Okay, That's there should be there. two more on there. Should say final. Oh, that's the PFAS one. Okay. Okay. That is my. This is yours. My drive, yeah. Yeah, I, I did the other one first. There it is. Click on it. Click on that. Yeah, I am. Oh, you are? And you can show an apple. You don't have to, like, slam it down. No, I'm just trying to. It's not response. Uh, no, that's the PFAS again. Here. Okay, final board stack. Let's try that. Here we go. All right. Thank you, folks. Thanks, everyone, for bearing with us. All right. Okay, great. Back at it. Brian Juros is going to come up and talk a little bit about. Brian, if you don't know, is also on the board of CAF. Yes. All right, thank you. That was awesome, Mari. Thank you. Great way to start. Um, Brian Jaros, uh, part of AgriLab Technologies. Jason McCune Sanders, part of our team here also today. Um, and personal note, healthy soil is part of what got me into this as a field. I, at the end of my own college uh, in New York in the 93, 94, I got involved in a recycling agency and it was the first I was involved in compost and I was like, wow, returning, kind of like your story, Andrew, to some extent, returning uh, organic residuals to the soil made so much more sense than recycling glass or plastic. Sorry to those who that may be your main thing, but um, that was my own personal light bulb moment. So um, in some form or other, I've been involved with composting ever since. Uh, also gotten to work with a number of folks over the years as part of um, board member of the Missisquoi River Basin Association, and there's some work around soil health with that. So these are actually some old slides from um, a healthy soils workshop I did with Tom Gilbert and Heather Darby close to 20 years ago. And some of these things still seemed very relevant. So that's what I wanted to put in here. Soil quality and soil health are, are similar terms and, and functionally the same. But again, it's, it's some of those things Mari spoke to of having your soil function better than it is. Um, in that aggregate. And what I would add to the earlier presentation that talked about waste management being an opportunity to a lesser degree in Vermont for reducing methane and greenhouse gas emissions, the other thing about introducing compost into our soils is it's an opportunity to put more carbon in the soil as an opportunity for carbon sequestration. So it, it has multiple benefits. Um, both on the greenhouse and, and climate side, but again, then again, resiliency, how are we gonna deal with these more intense storms, um, and, and kind of catching up for um, going past just compliance, and, and a regeneration is one of those terms, but you know, how, how are we going to restore a lot of the impacts? Um, I like this slide because um, while we can't easily hold and touch soil today in a, a session, I think this picture as well as any that I have shows a same exact soil type, one managed under conventional tillage, aggressively tilled, uh, one that's got more reduced tillage practices, additions of organic matter, maintaining that surface cover, not drying out the surface of the soil. My own personal experience, as some of you may remember, Jack Laser, who farmed up in Westford, or sorry, Westfield and up into Troy, and he had some property along the Missisquoi River in, in North Troy that was uh, managed with reduced frequent rotations, compost additions, um, cover crops, and then was immediately adjacent to a uh, corn silage field, conventionally tilled herbicide spray. Whoops, <laughs> I'm waving my hands too much. <laughs> But but it was it was the also my healthy soil light bulb moment where we put a shovel into each soil the cornfield corn silage was like a parking lot you could see the rain came on it 
who would wash soil off the surface right into the nearby river. Jack's land, he was proud of it. That was one of his things he was really proud of. We, it was soft to dig into, it crumbled apart in our hands. He was growing corn, same crop and everything, but a completely different approach to those integrated systems and adding organic matter, including compost from his bedded pack, was one of his strategies. All right, here's, here's what kind of hard to wrap our minds around sometimes when you just look at the soil, but um, there's the small, medium, and large, or the micro, meso, and, and macro pores in the soil. And as I understand, it's those intermediate or meso pores that actually are some of the hardest ones to achieve, but in a good, aggregated, crumbly soil that has the benefit of roots growing in it, those plant exudates that act as like glues and glomulins and all strange substances we're still learning, I'm still learning all their names and functions. Um, but that's where we get that amazing uh, increased resilience to both drought and to intense storms. So it can function uh, to have most, more, both more physical strength, it can hold up the weight of a tire or resist compaction with the heavy equipment we have better than, than a conventionally managed uh, soil that has had those aggregates destroyed. And it can also hold on to those moisture in those increasing periods of, of drought that we're seeing. Um, so wrap your mind around the mesopores. And then uh, this is my last slide, but again, just to, from the water quality impacts that we see in the Siskoi River, Lake Champlain, a lot of other water bodies around our state, um, certain soils, particularly a lot of our clay soils, are prone to the sealing over, uh, particularly when they are unvegetated, have not had organic matter additions and so forth. So when we can infiltrate these um, precipitation events and snow melt into that aggregated soil, we're gonna see a lot less of the manure, the soil particles with phosphorus attached to them run off into our streams and we're gonna be able to have it soak into our soil profile. Um, so those are the ones I wanted to share and I just, I'll let the group keep on going. I'm Kat Buxton. I live in Sharon, Vermont, and I'm a, a compost and soil geek. I just really like to learn from the soil, from the compost, from all the bugs, from the plants. And so I, too, am a student of soil health. Um, I run a business called Grow More Waste Less Food Systems Consulting, and one of my big projects right now is bringing systems just like this to elementary schools throughout the Upper Valley. It's called the Upper Valley Super Compost Project. Um, and I've been struggling with math today, but it, based on the numbers we learned this morning of 10,000 tons of compost, I'm assuming done well, uh, equals 15,000 car, no, 1,500 cars pulled off the road. We stand to get 15,000 cars off the road, the equivalent. So 200,000 pounds of food waste. <laughs> Um, it, it turns out that most schools, um, uh, two or three hundred kids, um, produce about 10,000 pounds of food waste a year. Um, and some of that is just little kids waste food, some of that is systemic, um, government rules about what kids need to be fed, and lots of, lots of reasons for that. But we want to help kids understand why managing our waste is really important and getting into a world where we can have some hope and some agency over resilience and adaptation to our changing world and our changing climate. And that one way to do that is just taking what we eat every day and cycling that back into our ecosystems. And to do that, to help create the soil sponge. Um, that's a term that I first heard coined by Dee Dee Pursehouse, who's from Thetford, Vermont. She wrote a really great book called The Ecology of Care. Um, and came up with this term, the soil sponge, which I think really gives us a visual of what's happening when we're adding organic matter to soil and we're following the soil health principles, um, which were designed by the NRCS. Check those out if you don't know about them. Um, we are creating the conditions for a sponge to form in our soil um, through the work of billions and billions of microorganisms interacting with plants, and photosynthesis. Um, I don't like to read my slides, so I'll, I'll leave this up long enough for you to 
see some of these statistics, but these are some of the things that I really like to try and get kids excited about, and adults too. I'm the co-founder of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, so we create lots of spaces for people to co-learn together um, and gain a love and understanding for the very ground that supports us in every single thing that we do. These are those principles. Uh, and here, I've just tried to tie them by color, uh, sort of directly to compost. So I, I do work a lot with kids, um, from very little kids all the way up through high school and college. And um, teaching about the soil health principles is one of the first things I do, whether you're seven or you're a beginning farmer uh, with NOFA or anyone else. Understanding the soil health principles, I believe, are really important. And the one that I didn't list here uh, that is the most important is context. So where in the world are you? What are you doing? What are you trying to grow? What are your limitations? You know, there are a lot of things to think about before you employ these principles. And when these principles are employed, we get to see like what's happening on Mari's farm. That's because she's following these principles. It's intuitive to follow these principles. Earth Nature all around us is following these principles. If left alone, she will cover bare spots. She will maximize diversity above and below the ground, minimize disturbance. And notice it doesn't say no disturbance. Um, we're growing food, we're being humans, we're doing our thing. To think that we're not disturbing is just wrong. We are. And that's OK. That's part of what we do. Um, hoof action from animals disturbing soil is also an important part of improving soil health and pastures. Minimizing bare soil, having animals in contact with soil, and that's everything from your bacteria and grasshoppers to your cows and elephants, right? Like all, and humans, we're animals too. Contact the soil, it's really good for you. Um, and if we follow these principles, we're slowing and sinking the rainwater. So I hope you were following the color squares on the side showing how compost relates to these soil health principles. And this is one of my star schools. This is Thetford Elementary School where I've been working with them for 15 years managing their edible schoolyard and composting system. And this is where the Super Compost Project was born. After having compost with fifth and sixth graders for 10 years, and seeing how well that they, they do, how incredible our schoolyard has become. We no longer bring in food fertilizer of any kind. We don't buy compost. We recycle all of our school lunch right back into our schoolyard. It goes back into the school lunchroom and then right back again. We've got a complete food loop. Um, that school went from 10,000 pounds a year to 6,000 pounds a year. So by creating these practices and developing the conditions, uh, for cultural change and behavior change, we've actually managed to reduce our food waste. Kids are cleaning their plates. Food service has changed the way that they're ordering food. It's taken a while, but we've made a really big difference there. Um, and then in addition to doing this food loop composting at school, I teach soil science to fifth and sixth graders. And they learn about the soil health principles. And by the time they graduate sixth grade, they can recite the soil health principles and they can usually even get down to like uh, some of the microbes, back, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, and they know the term goose, glue, snots, and slimes, which is something I drill into their heads. <laughs> Uh, and here they are again, uh, some of the things that we do in addition to learning about the soil health principles, we go outside and we look, and we look at all the ways that plants and soil and water interact with each other just in our schoolyard. Every schoolyard has places that are super compacted, which gives us an opportunity to show how water movement changes when plants are involved. So when we talk about like what's the connection between soil health and composting and climate change and adaptation and resilience, it's everywhere. It's all of it. It's so critical. And I think our speaker this morning, Sally Brown, who was amazing and totally made me laugh. I just love her. Um, she said that this is, it, you know, it's not just killing the planet less. It's about creating the conditions for healing. And that's our super compost shed at um, Sharon Elementary School. We'll be putting in 20 more. Uh, we just got a federal grant to help support that. All right, we're just gonna keep
keep going through here. Joshua, you want to come yeah. up next? Sorry. Just introduce yourself. Yep. Good afternoon. Joshua Faulkner, um, a research associate professor at UVM Extension and coordinate the Foreign and Climate Change Program um, and also direct the soil testing lab at UVM. Um, and if I'm completely honest, a lot of my interest in soil comes out of how it interacts with water um, and kind of my interest in how water moves through a landscape and soil, of course, is a tremendously important piece of that. Um, and especially in the context of climate change and how we know um, how climate change is impacting farms and soils in, in the state, from extreme events and excessive precipitation and to drought. And soil is just such an important um, piece of that and tool that we can manage um, to hopefully lessen the impacts on farmers. So. I do a lot of talks on, on soil health, and, and this is a slide I use a lot. Um, and I think this is going to kind of help reinforce what Kat and, and um, Brian and Mari talked about. Um, so I'm going to just focus on a couple data slides after this, but I really want to hone in on how compost, the role that compost plays in all of this, because that's what we're all here to discuss today. Um, but really, I think soil health, for me, boils down to three, and I'm a little bit of a reductionist, three um, principles, and, and those are soil cover, and Brian had a great slide on that, how it prevents this crusting, the, the destruction of aggregates and surface sealing that can occur with, with heavy storms. Um, and then it also helps, um, we, we need to build organic matter in our soils, and that's, that's where compost really kind of comes into this this story around soil health and, and climate resilience and how, and how soils, soils add to that. Um, and then reduce disturbance, right? So once we've kept our soil covered and we've, we've built our organic matter, we've provided the food and the fuel for all the biological life to build those aggregates, to form those aggregates and build really well-structured soils, the last thing we want to do, of course, is to go in and destroy that structure with disturbance. And disturbance, of course, is part, really important part of some types of agriculture. But there are ways in which we can reduce that disturbance and, and use alternative approaches, you know, even shift some of our timing of disturbance to help aid with building this healthy soil that is more sponge-like and soaks up these, these rainstorms and this, this excess moisture. And uh, of course, I'll, I'll, look, I'll work a lot on water quality. And, and in that world, it's all about reducing runoff. And I think there's two ways of looking at this, right? There's we need to reduce runoff, and then there's we need to increase infiltration. And that's, that's really the opening, I think, that we have for healthy soils and, and use of compost to enter the, enter the conversation most effectively around water quality and agriculture and resilience. All right, so just a couple data slides. This is from a study that was done in California um, on tomato production, and they looked at three different production systems, um, two conventional systems. One was a two-year rotation, one's a four-year rotation. And then they also compared that to a low input system, um, which used cover crops during the, the winter time. They used some green manure. Um, but they still use synthetic fertilizer. And then there was also a fourth uh, um, management system that was an organic management system. And really the key difference in that system was the usage of compost. All right, and here you're looking at a rainfall infiltration study that was performed on those four different management systems. Um, and you can see what a difference um, the infiltration rates are during this, this particular storm event um, in the low organic matter systems versus the high organic matter systems. And really that, that is the difference in these soils in terms of how, how you could quantify the, chain, the differences would be the organic matter content. And a lot of this is due to the, the compost and the green manures in, those, in, in the low input and the organic systems there, um, which have the higher infiltration rates. And then the same study um, really is kind of the flip side of this climate change quarter, right, is, is that resilience to drought. Um, and, and these are those four systems there. And, and here they quantified the soil water holding capacity. And, 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 you know, in Vermont, we have these heavy storms, really, our climate change story is wetter and wetter and, and more extreme storms. But the patterns are changing, too, so that we are seeing more drought in the summertime. And farmers are really trying to deal with that, 
that reality, and it's a little counterintuitive intuitive to the public when they see how much more rain we're getting, that we could also have drought. But, but farmers are certainly experiencing this. And this, you see, our conventional systems and our, our, our low input system more or less having the same soil, soil water holding capacity. But this organic system that has this compost addition is, has a much greater water holding capacity. So I think this is just good to kind of the concepts are, are really nice to hear, but it's also nice to back it up with some data from, from actual field trials. So that's what I wanted to add today. All right. We'll queue it up here. Okay. Alyssa's coming up next. There we go. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Alyssa White. I, um, and the New England Deputy Director for the American Farmland Trust, but I have a, I live about 20 minutes from here in Huntington, and I uh, completed my PhD in plant and soil science at the University of Vermont with a couple people in the room here, Deb Nair and Joshua Faulkner. And I've worked with a lot of folks in Vermont, um, so some of this might not be new, but I think I was invited because I have quite a bit of research about soil health in Vermont, and also kind of farmers' perceptions and, and things that influence their adoption of soil health practices and their kind of capacity to, to um, purchase more compost. So um, I'll just start by saying that uh, when I first started at the University of Vermont, I did this project called the New England Adaptation Survey where I, I asked farmers all across New England how they were changing their management to account for the increases in extreme weather that Joshua was just talking about. And the most common practice that farmers identified was building soil health. 74% of farmers were using soil health building strategies to account for already, already to account for increases in heavy precipitation events and drought. And I think the rest of the research that I did while I was at the University of Vermont was really kind of pulling on that thread of the value of soil health and how we can support greater adoption of practices like that that um, enable um, adaptation. All right, so I have just three kind of things I want to share. The first is about how we measure soil health. So as a researcher and a scientist at the University of Vermont, some of the work that I did was really around um, understanding what the soil health levels were on certain farms and where there were opportunities for increasing that. And I think some of the previous presenters have talked about this. There's been a real evolution in how we conceptualize soil health and what we want to measure about it. And so uh, Deb here has a really great paper that she led about that change and, and how we understand and, and think about soil health and soil quality. You know, 100 years ago, it was really about nutrients and just those chemical indicators of soil health. Um, Brian was talking about soil quality, right? So those are the attributes of the soil that we care about. And when you talk to farmers now, and I've done interviews and surveys and focus groups with farmers in Vermont about things like soil health in the environment, when they talk about soil health, they're really conceptualizing it more in terms of what this new NRCS um, definition is, which is really about the biological function. So that's the really the ecological function, the biological processes and those organisms that are the foundation um, of those qualities that we care about. And so I wanted to offer here the, the on the, the right here is the Cornell Soil Health Lab. The way that they think about how we measure soil health is these three big kind of buckets. There's chemical indicators of soil health, there's physical, and there's biological. And there's a ton of different things that you can measure. What you measure matters, right? So you should be measuring things that relate to what you care about. So if you're interested in infiltration and and water holding capacity, you want to be measuring kind of physical indicators that tell you something about that. If you're just curious about biology, there are lots of things you can measure from just, you know, a respiration and CO2 burst, or you could talk to Deb about measuring nematode populations and some of the more interesting biological processes. But um, I think w uh, Woods Lab is here. They offer a similar package to Cornell where you can send your soil in and get um, an assessment of lots of different different indicators from these three buckets. And I think this is a fascinating conversation that I don't have time to say today, except that um, one of the projects that I worked on at, while I was at the University of Vermont, we measured this Cornell package across far, on farms across the state of Vermont so that we could compare using the same package the soil health uh, lab at UVM, I think they're working on a similar, maybe more affordable package of soil health indicators. So that's something really exciting to look for in the future. OK, from that study that I just mentioned, we called it the state of soil health in Vermont in, in this uh, 2021. We measured this package from the Cornell 
soil health lab on um, 221 farm fields. And just to give us an idea of where we're starting from, because there's so much conversation about how we need to increase soil health in the state of Vermont for all of these benefits and reasons that you already know, but we didn't know where we were starting from, right? And so here's, um, I just have the organic matter data here for you because I think that is a, a really great foundational metric that, that captures the dynamic foundation of the soil, and especially soil carbon. There's a lot of conversation about that. We can measure soil carbon using other metrics, but the part of the soil carbon that's changing is this organic matter piece, and it's relatable for farmers. So what we found is exciting news. Vermont's above average. You already knew that. <laughs> Um, but the average farm field, the average of all the farm fields we measured was 4.3% organic matter. The national average that we could fi find from an NRCS study done in 2010 is 3.2. What I think is, is interesting here is you can see there's a huge amount of variability in organic matter and organic carbon content in our farm fields. Pasture fields seem to be doing great. That's not maybe like the place that has the greatest need here, but it's annual systems like vegetable and, and corn um, fields that have a lot of opportunity for change. The other thing we found were like some really great examples of really high organic matter. Some of those pasture fields had 11% organic matter on them. There are some incredible corn fields and those are generally associated with farms that have a lot of organic matter from their animal systems to put back in those fields. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And I just wanted to mention that state of soil health data set is available from you can email us or it's on the Vermont NRCS website. There's also a report that's pretty easy to find if you search the internet for it. Okay, um, the, the other thing I wanted to share with you was some, um, just some information about how farmers are thinking about soil health. And I think it's an exciting time because there's a lot of NRCS funding to support adoption of soil health practices. The soil carbon amendment is turned on in Vermont right now that should I imagine some of you probably already know that to support farmers in covering the cost of applying biochar or other carbon amendments to their soil. Um, but you, Vermont is really unique in, in comparison to other contexts in terms of where the, um, the leverage points are for supporting farmers in adopting new practices like uh, buying more compost. So <laughs> this survey that we did with 179 farmers in 2022 across the state of Vermont, all different types of farms, the majority of farmers in Vermont um, already believe that soil health benefits are good for the environment. They, sh they believe that they should be adopting practices to increase soil health. They even believe that they should be part of climate solutions. And so Vermont farmers, this would be different in other parts of the country and the world. Like they're motivated. There's a high level of stewardship um, and they're really motivated to make the change. Um, I think this last one that's highlighted there is the important piece. So 94% of farmers that we surveyed believe that they already have the knowledge and technical skill to enhance soil health, but only 58% of them have the financial capacity to do so. And so that just, I think, points to the, the, major, the major limitation here is just the cost of some of the soil amendments. And so I think Vermont's an exciting place to be having conversations about how we support farmers in adopting the practices that they want because we have such um, a close and collaborative relationship with the state, Agency of Agriculture, and the ANR, and the new Climate Office and Climate Action Plan, as well as NRCS to be able to um, pull, you know, just put in new tools to, to get the cost down for farmers. So I think that's, that's what I wanted to share, um, which hopefully is a good setup for Ryan Patch. Thank you, uh, uh, Alyssa. Ryan Patch, Vermont Agency of Agriculture, uh, Food and Markets. I am the um, Agriculture, Climate Change, and Land Use Policy Manager there. I work in the Administration Division. Uh, I'm going to go back, uh, if it's all right with you, Alyssa, and just put this up on the board um, because this, I think, is one of the most important takeaways I think we have about the current state of where soil health fits into uh, the state's approach to uh, addressing climate change and addressing other environmental issues such as water quality, and that is a very large focus on soil health. So uh, as an executive branch of state government, the legislature gives us a lot of rubrics that we have to work within and definitions and other framings that uh, tend to invade the lexicon. Uh, and so one thing that is uh, very, I, I think, heartening to see in state law 
uh, is the definition of uh, healthy soils, right? That is in there, there's a definition. Uh, there was a three-year working group uh, to explore uh, how uh, so healthy soils can help contribute to a number of different ecosystem services. And uh, the output of that is, is rather heartening uh, as far as the number of farmers who uh, not only believe uh, soil health can have a benefit, uh, those that think they have a responsibility, but the big challenge, the financial capacity. And so that's some of the role I think state government has is trying to support farmers to overcome those barriers, uh, whether that's through grant programs uh, as a result of the uh, payment for ecosystem services and soil health working group. There was a new program stood up to help get farmers into a new tranche of funding through the federal government. And so lots of opportunities for state and federal partnership uh, to help support the adoption and implementation of soil health practices, which of course includes uh, composting. Uh, I'm gonna keep my remarks very brief uh, to get to the discussion portion. I just wanna say within uh, the uh, Vermont Climate Council, uh, they put out the initial climate action plan a few years ago. We're, our, we're due to begin the process of standing up a rewrite for uh, the climate action plan. Uh, and so that would be a big area of focus over the next uh, 14 months or so. I will say the, the big focus that uh, we emphasized in the first round and will continue to be there is the emphasis on soils as the framework to provide significant mitigation benefit of greenhouse gases. Um, those programs are established, we have tracking in place, focusing on uh, resilience and resilience strategies for which soil health and healthy soils can play a part. Uh, I'm hoping we'll take a, a bigger uh, role in the discussions uh, that will be uh, taking place in the agriculture and ecosystems uh, subcommittee. Um, yeah, we, you know, within the Agency of Agriculture, uh, the management of waste and agricultural waste uh, touches many different divisions, uh, slaughter waste and food safety consumer protection, ag residual management and the farm division, uh, veil and, and of course chemistry, uh, and then water quality, uh, ensuring that uh, the, the, the management of waste and other ag waste uh, comport with uh, water quality uh, regulation. So uh, can answer questions uh, uh, in that degree, um, but looking towards um, you know, what the role of soil health in uh, preparing for uh, climate change and climate disasters that are forthcoming. Joshua touched on drought and deluge and how increasing organic matter uh, has been seen throughout a number of the presentations about how valuable that can be for uh, allowing infiltration and retention. Uh, but there's only so much organic matter when we're getting enough rain to have flash floods on the top of mountains. And so thinking about recovery uh, from those types of events, likely no amount of organic matter, if you're in one of those deluges, um, can at some level uh, you know, pr protect the soils. And so thinking about um, <clears throat> for a, a resilient future, managing uh, the, the soils is certainly uh, an essential uh, part of how farmers interface with the land, uh, but also what resources and programs are there to help people recover into, uh, you know, need to be set up as we see more of these um, climate disasters and climate events happening in Vermont is something that is unresolved and will hopefully be uh, a part of that agriculture and ecosystem discussion as well. So, um, yeah, in short, uh, everything that has been shared uh, prior to me is absolutely uh, something that is, I think, emphasized and held up at, at the center of uh, the state's uh, drafting and promulgation of the Climate Action Plan, and we're hopefully going to elevate that even further uh, in this next round of rewrites. So looking forward to discussion and questions. Thanks. Okay, don't sit down, Ryan. I'm gonna invite you all to come on up and, and sit at the panel table here. Um, this way, our panelists got to see all the slides. So now they've got, also got microphones up there. Uh, oh, are there. Oh, there are. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, wow, right? There's a lot of good information there. 
and I think I have a lot of questions, but I want to be generous. Um, I'm, I'm, let's just ask the audience first. What, what are your questions? What's, what's, what resonated with you out of those conversations? I'm sure there's multiple aspects of things you want to talk about, um, or we could just go to Prohibition Pig. Not. <laughs> I will come up with questions to keep you all here until it's time to be recessed. 12 years of Catholic school, I know all about the rules. So, questions? Yes, here we go. Uh, yeah, hang on and wait for the microphone, thanks. First of all, I could ask Laurie a million questions, but I'll restrain it on the farm. Um, my question was, uh, so that was an amazing presentation. Um, we've heard about uh, that, what is that regulation that is supposedly paying farmers to apply compost on their fields? 336. 336, is that for real? <laughs> I'm curious. Uh, I think it's a great question. I think we want to explore that. Do you want to answer? If, if you guys don't want to answer, I, I do have a little information on it. Do you all want to talk about it? Go for it. Um, there is a, I'll just explain that. I'm a, one of the things we do as a company, we're called technical service providers for the NRCS. And they've had this practice on the books called Soil Carbon Amendment, which as, um, is your name? Alyssa. Alyssa mentioned actually paid farms to uh, purchase and apply compost and also biochar. And it's a fledgling program. Um, and uh, we have found, I've been trying to encourage it uh, nationwide, um, but we've found that it, like a lot of their programs, they're not quite sure how to administer it. So it's been very little used. California is the only state that I know of that's used it extensively at this point. But all the New England states are trying. Um, so it is as simple as signing up um, and potentially getting a contract. If you can show that your soils will benefit from exogenous organic matter being brought in um, by your um, soil organic matter level, water holding capacity, if any of those are, are a little low, um, based on the testing that Woods End Lab does or Cornell, University of Maine, they all have these soil tests that you can use for that. Um, a farm can actually get paid for purchasing and then applying compost or sometimes a, a, a combination of biochar and compost. And what I encourage people to do for a long time is just have farmers go in and sign up because until that happens, um, it's, it's tough for any one of the individual field offices to know exactly how to run this program. But in theory, uh, again, if you are a farmer cooperating with NRCS and you can demonstrate that yes, compost would improve the soil health of my soil, you could be eligible to get paid to purchase those in the line. So I, I think it's a, it, an amazing program if it ends up working, but it's fledgling. There, in each New England state, there are only a handful of farms that have actually been able to use it and take advantage of it. It seems like it shouldn't be too difficult to make that case, right? No. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask the panelists, anyone have any experience with that, or they know of a farm who has been able to do that? This sounds like a... I do. I have worked with a couple farms. Okay. Done it. And, and I'm assuming they pay by the acre? No, um, they pay by the yard. By the cubic yard of, of compost delivered, okay, and it can be. And it's a good payment. It's um, sorry. I'm sorry to uh, take over the conversation, but it's actually a, it's a substantial payment. It does pay for typically pays a little bit more than compost costs. It's a it's sixty three dollars a yard. So that's for okay. purchasing it and applying it. Yeah. Who who here sells compost and how much are you selling it for? <laughs> Bob, what are you selling your compost for? I'm sorry, what? How much do you sell your compost oh, for? I have um, five distributors. This is in Brattleboro. Uh, and they pay $30 a cubic yard. And then they mark it up and sell it to their customers. I'm going to pass back to Oh, Dan. yeah, sorry. Do you wanna... <laughs> <laughs> What's the... It's What's the other yeah. end of the range? Yeah, we we bring out the compost in Wilson. We keep changing our prices so I don't remember what they are. But I think 79, by, well, we, it's a range, but 79 is one of the dollars. So it wouldn't, last year it might have worked for us, but this year you would have to chip in to get your NRCS discount and make it still work. And, and yet, if a farmer had to pay 
80 and Kim Yard was getting 63 back, that's still a pretty good deal, yeah. right? That's well, I, mean, I think part of it is large-scale farms aren't typically buying compost to apply at rates that would make a difference right. in the soil or organic matter that's it's going to encourage that potentially. We're all for it. So um, the retail price for compost is $240 <coughs> a yard, and uh, wholesale is $135. Say who you are and where you are. Oh yeah, so Tower Compost in Los Angeles, and we make everything by hand. Nice. Shipping nice. might be a problem. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I do think it's a, one of those um, programs that CAV and all of you out there can be helping to support. Right, the more. We advertise it, the more we talk about it, the more we um, have conversations with farmers about um, signing up and um, get a simple soil test. And I really can't believe that any soil test we take in Vermont wouldn't have something that could be improved, except maybe Murray's farm. <laughs> and you should go visit her farm. Yeah. So I imagine you want to move on from the topic, but since there's understandable interest in it, to just give some context to what Andrew's talking about, because I also work with the farmer that I know that is uh, using this practice. They're the only one in the state of Maine that is being allowed to do it this year because the state is still trying to figure it out. And so I've talked to other farmers who said, yeah, I looked into it and my district person said it's not available. And that's going to be the case many times over. So that's why Andrew is saying you need to have the producer talk to NRCS and, but at the same time, NRCS is trying to figure out how they're going to do this. Mm -hmm. And then they just looked at that bill for this one farm, and they're, <laughs> the gears are turning, and they're realizing, oh, this is going to be tricky. So keep your eyes open, but maybe keep the conversation going. So they're looking at the bill as in the invoice? Is they're saying, OK, well, that's one part of the equation, right? We've got to convince them that there's a triple bottom line to that. OK, thanks. Next questions. Oh, uh, did you have a no, panel? I mean, just for more information on that, I believe that it was only that practice was turned on for payment in Vermont just in the last two years, I think. That so it is very fresh to NRCS, but they want to use it. And as those of you that, that work with farmers, there's this new list of climate smart ag and forestry practices that's eligible for this huge pot of new money, and it's on the list. So they're motivated to figure out how to get it out. And I think it's a really great time for folks that have this type of knowledge in this room to step in and help make that connection. I'll and I'll just very quickly add that last year, we did have NRCS do a session at VORS, which is online, that talks about this practice explicitly. Oh. Um, but it was really new. And some of the numbers that were presented there in terms of payment have changed. So you can learn more about the concepts there, but don't hold NRCS to the numbers that they provided. Um, other questions or comments, just points of discussion? I just want to ask a question. Are there mics on? Can you guys hear them OK? Is it getting picked up on the recording? It's just the recording. It's not the video. Oh, OK. Great. Next question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Scott from Bennington. Um, the, uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, soil as, as a as a sponge effectively to, to, to retain water. Um, have, has there been any sort of um, cross conversations with um, like the Vermont uh, floodplain initiative and, and, or other uh, river corridor sort of um, conservation efforts? Anyone here in watershed from DEC? Wow. Uh, there's what? some anecdotal. You know, I have small scale stuff happening like I can talk about in uh, the White River Valley where we experience quite a lot of flooding. Um, there are groups that are working together to restore riparian habitats and employ some agroforestry practices on farms near rivers and using compost to do so. So it's, I, but I don't know about any agency capacity sort of that level conversation would be really nice. Anybody talking like that, Ryan? Um. We, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a push pull a, with a lot of uh, priorities depending on on where you're coming from. But um, natural climate solutions and looking to how we manage our floodplains, 
uh, to provide for resilience is absolutely a, a hot topic. And so uh, within the agricultural sector, uh, helping to educate uh, those in other sectors or, or other areas about uh, the opportunity for uh, managing soils within the floodplain and, and you know for a high degree of soil health and what that can mean for water holding capacity and storm surge uh, it's certainly been a, a multiple year uh, conversation uh, and um, one where there's programs that are available for farmers who want to enroll in a flood, floodplain program we have the CREP program um, but as far as giving uh, kind of the, the the recognition within a, a watershed basis. Uh, certainly, uh, as Alyssa was, was saying, within the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group, we, we looked at the ability for healthy soils to contribute to watershed-wide uh, water holding capacity. And very much of that is very site and location specific uh, and, and kind of soil management specific. So there's, there's definitely a great opportunity being able to say these are the areas where this, this, and this happens, or you can be compensated for this, this, and this. We're, we're not at that level, but certainly there's multiple discussions ongoing about you know how, how do we manage our, our floodplains and uh, I'm certainly trying to bring uh, the perspective and, and science on how well managed agricultural fields can contribute to uh, a resilient watershed. I, I will just to I think make an important point I want to echo something Ron said that you know events like July 23 this past year it's it, those are not a soil health issue. The, those are going to be really damaging because of where they're falling. They're falling. A lot of that is on forested ground, which has really high infiltration rates anyway. And I don't think there's any kind of agreement in the scientific community that soil health would really buffer against some of that that damage that occurs in the in the in the floodplain. Yeah. Uh, can I just follow up on? Is it a watershed question? No. Okay. I just want to follow up. There are, you know, the agency of natural resources has an entire division dedicated to watershed um, coordination and activities. They do watershed planning. They, I've seen their little um, demonstration where they run water over different surface types and show the difference between those surfaces that allow for infiltration and those that are um, much more prone to runoff. So there are, and I don't see anyone from DC here who's in that group, but, um, and Watershed Alliance farmer, um, is Northwest farmers? There's several of those. Yeah, I mean, I think they're one of the pioneers of our soil health uh, conversation that we're having. So I think that there's a lot of information in the farming community about what they can do to build soil health and then yeah, some of the, some of the flood damage we're seeing is um, you know taking out some of their efforts. Like I, I drive along either the Winooski or the Lamoille pretty regularly, and you see these tree planting things that happened, and those trees are no longer there. Or there's like every fourth one because the stream banks have been pulled down so much by the recent floods. Thanks. Question in the back. Brian, do you want to keep this I, I conversation wanna... going before we? I can wait to add it it's in the watershed context. So please, Steve, go ahead. Watershed context. Yeah, if it's, if it's about the watershed question, let's finish up that topic, because I think we're going to switch gears here. So the, to add to all this discussion here, the, some of the, what I've read about the frequency of storms that are like in the one to three inch range have been a 30% increase in, or 70% increase in the last 30 years in Vermont. So Vermont has already been affected and and certainly we're likely to get these massive deluge events that are beyond soil resilience capacity, but we're going to have a number of these larger storms that generate runoff. That And that is the segment of storm where soil health resiliency probably can have the most impact. And then thinking to other watershed work that's been done, there's a lot of uh, critical source area or hydrological sensitive area mapping that's been done over the last 15 or 20 years. So it's often only 10% of a field or of a watershed that's generating a disproportionate amount of the phosphorus. So just thinking through all these presentations today, perhaps that's an opportunity because we don't have compost enough to put everywhere. We can't necessarily put it in our annual floodplains because it's prone to being taken away, but there are areas of runoff and saturation that may be our opportunity to have some targeted 
improvements in soil quality. And, and your slide triggered this as well, where we have a lot of good soil organic matter, but there are some cornfields with very low soil organic matter, and those are likely the culprits for a lot of runoff, nutrient, and sediment loss. So um, not that I have a, a plan that seems like an opportunity with limited resources to focus on a few hot spots um, to really try to improve soil resiliency in those areas. Sounds like you got a ready grant to get that mapping project done. Mm -hmm. Regional planning commissions. Um, I think, um, is this watershed related, Bob? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. We'll finish that up. Can we get Mike here? Thanks. I'll hold the mic right up there. One um, aspect we haven't talked about much today is using best management practices for erosion control. Uh, using soil-based um, measures like filter berms and filter socks. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, that's something Boars has covered extensively. But it is, I think, almost a more likely use for some of our organic products than just amending floodplain soils. Because it takes such a huge quantity, you know, where you're where you can target, you know, a, a construction site or so it's just another piece of this puzzle. So. Thanks, Bob. Great. Anything else on the watershed? <laughs> I want to add something to talk about. You want to? Okay. One thing when we get talking about the soil, we got to remember the plants. We want the soil, so we got plants. I mean, that was mentioned earlier. We got to keep this cover on there, because otherwise, if you don't have plants, it's going to just wash away. <laughs> so, the whole idea of putting a lot of good compost is, you know, we're trying to produce our food and, and our forages and pastures. And also, just one other little thing, when we think about the sponge, it deals with water, but that's the habitat for the biology. You have to have that porous structure and fabric for them to live in, and that balance of air and water makes all the difference about who's there and how many. That's right, the other water ecosystem, right? That's right, the other aquatic ecosystem is soil. Let's get to Steve in the back there. That is a perfect segue to my question or comment. Um, so we hear a lot about increasing soil organic matter, carbon sequestration, um, but it, we also hear about the soil micro, uh, the, um, microbiology in, in soils. And I'm wondering uh, if any of you can comment on the idea of using compost as an inoculant um, to increase the uh, number and diversity of microorganisms in the soil. Um, I've heard anecdotally that there are, um, uh, the, that focus is providing some significant results for improving crop health and productivity. So just if any of you have any comments about that. It's, so it's not so much the quantity, which is important, but the quality as measured by um, the diversity and, and, and um, uh, numbers of microbes in, in, in a particular compost that's being made. We should let Dad oh, We should let Dad go. We just have another expert. She should be on the <laughs> This has been an active area of research of mine at the University of Vermont for the last uh, 10 to 15 years. So uh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I look at compost as a delivery mechanism for microbes, and not only do you get the microbes, but you get its habitat, and you get its food. It comes as a package deal, right? So um, I was going to say that's an excellent point, and I, I do see compost as a way. To, now, there, that said, we need to think carefully about what our recipe is and our process and how we make that compost because all of those matter and influence who's living in that compost. I mean, with the type of carbon you use makes an impact. Whether you do this aerated static pile or a windrow, that makes a difference. It, outcome is a different microbial community. I'll stop there. <laughs> well, just follow up. Is there, are, are there, um, <laughs> is there a the infrastructure here in Vermont of looking at um, the soil, my, uh, the uh, the microbial quality of compost? Is that something that UVM is doing? Or is anybody else doing that here? Get her up 
we're working on it, okay? <laughs> so we know we need the biology, and that's one of the, the directions that we're going um, in the future with our soil health testing, because um, we know that's super important. The challenge is to get something that's also affordable and responds to management practices and the utility of it. So it's kind of a trifecta trying to find the right thing. I mean, we can start out simple. I mean, one of the first things we're gonna start out is looking at fungal to bacterial ratios and using a test that's called a PLFA, phospholipid fatty acids. So that's one that we can do relatively fast um, and is kind of the gold standard among soil ecologists. They like that. I mean, it goes well in conjunction with DNA. We can do DNA stuff, but honestly, what you want to know is what they're doing. Um, and some of the other tests we'll look at will be more organic forms of carbon and organic forms of nitrogen. Most of traditional tests have been on inorganic forms. Um, so that they're related to the biology, but I mean, we're going to start with the fungal to uh, bacterial ratio. That's a starting point. Um, I'd love to do more, but I can't clone myself very well yet. <laughs> no, imagine a day when you can walk into an extension office or a state office and get a nice little kit and put your that, all that in your shingle and send it, right? Like, it's, let's, let's the, imagine that. The field of soil biology is so young, we're still trying to figure out who is there. We only know 10% of the species, and the next step is to figure out what they're doing. So we're really, it's a, it's a very infant field. And so that's why we don't have all the answers, but the tools of the molecular tools are opening up that box. And we're going to see massive um, developments and increase in our knowledge. And that's when it'll start to become affordable. Right now, we're just still trying to figure it all out. <laughs> so stay tuned. Yeah. Keep those plants in there. That's the, that's the bottom line. They're the ones feeding that community and the bottom of the food web. Can you give us a sense of what the ratios are? Do you know that yet? Uh, that was a question about what the ratios are, and then Caleb will get to you next. I mean, one of the keys is we have to figure out the range that we have in the Vermont soil, so be like building on the surveys that Alyssa has done. I don't think there's a magic number. A lot of it depends on which kind of ecosystem you're supporting. Mm -hmm. For example, a forest would be very different than an ag land, um, so it's a good for what question, but those are some of the things that we really want to work on in the, the, uh, in the soil health testing capacity we can do at UVM is updating reports. Those are desperately needed and we haven't had a chance to, haven't had the resources until recently to even think about it. So um, first we have to, I think, find what the range is and then what, you know, how that patterns across the state. We can start by quartiles and then we can start, we need to do field trials also, see how different management practices influence that. So some basic research, but we're aiming for the applied. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to add in a little bit and hopefully not misrepresent uh, some work that's been done in Maine with with the broader context that there's, in the vegetable farming world, a lot of interest in deep compost mulch, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that has driven a lot of these discussions in a lot of ways. Um, and some of the work that was done by some extension folks in Maine was looking at different rates of application, where after f about, I think it was a four, but let's say I'm wrong and say it's 10 yards per acre rate, um, yield stopped increasing. Mm -hmm. So. That's not as, that's very much leaving the black box, a very dark black box, but it's still telling you important information because if the, the microbes were way out of whack, your, your yield wouldn't have increased and then leveled off, although it depends on the compost possibly. But some of these deep compost mulch systems that we're seeing, at least for the initial phase where the compost is being used Yes, for these soil health purposes, but also just the mechanical blocking of light to stop weeds. And um, I don't know if this is a comment uh, to encourage a, a certain question, or maybe this is just the question, but I, I would say that I have the question of, um, are we robbing Peter to pay Paul in terms of moving carbon around across our landscape? Because um, it's not a zero-sum game, however, at some point, 
when you're making a lot of compost and you're bringing in a lot of carbon from all sorts of different places, yes, you're improving qualities, but then you're probably distributing it to a much smaller land mass than it came from. Whereas, were that dairy that supplied the manure to have reapplied the manure back to its own land base, would that be a greater net benefit over the entire landscape? And I, I don't know that anyone knows the answer, but I'm hoping folks are, are thinking through that a little bit. Yeah, okay. I could just say that that's part of why we're doing this school thing. Um, we want to keep nutrients local to where they came from. Not that the food that the schools are serving <laughs> grew more than just a little fraction, but it's created there, so let's stop the trucking there and produce the compost that goes right back into the schoolyard and the community gardens uh, so that we can make compost more accessible, affordable, keep it healthy, and get it in our communities. Yeah, localizing I think is really important. And we can see just with the, what, what happened in Vermont, um, we passed our law and lots of great things happened, but we also created opportunities for depacking plants and trucking waste to Maine and shredding it with plastic and yada yada, right? So it, it's how it's done, I think is important. It's not the cow, it's the how. That applies to everything, right? <laughs> I, yeah. I can say you're, thought brought up a, a structural <laughs> issue that I think you posed in a question that you posed at the start of this panel. Like what are the barriers to more comp? Is there enough available? Um, and your point of, of moving all the carbon around is a lot of the manure in Vermont is in a liquid slurry form. So maybe 40, 50 years ago, that was with bedding, the carbon was with it in the barn. Mm -hmm. And now the majority of probably the, at least the larger conventional dairies and a number of the smaller dairies that's going into lagoon. And the nitrogen loss from that is massive. It's from a class I took with extension, it was like 50 to 90% of the nitrogen as excreted from the cow is lost in our systems that are just land applying that liquid manure. So we're losing a t massive amount of fertility through in some ways protecting water quality from direct runoff. So you'd have to restructure something of the scale of the McNeil Energy plant, you know, all the biomass that's going in there to help heat and power Burlington. If that was no longer operating, could that carbon be effectively redistributed to those farms for composting? That would be a huge shift in <laughs> all the logistics, but that would be, the, in my mind, some of the scale of change that would have to happen to you know, even have those farms turn all that slurry manure into compost. Um, so there's, there are some real challenges and it would have to undo a lot of momentum of infrastructure that's been set up over the last 20 to 50 years. So it's a, it's a tough question, but that, that would be the change that would need to happen to really have all these farms be building their own or, organic matter. We like tough questions. It inspires us and wants us to be creative and use our imaginations and think about a better, a better solution, a better way to treat our planet. So that's all good. Other questions? Oh, Mari had a... Oh, sorry, Mari. I was just going to say, sorry, in terms of organic farms using um, compost to squelch weeds, I mean, I think we got very scared 10 years ago or more when just the phosphorus numbers um, were mm. way too high. And um, and then so again, just our little experiment is I just heard a podcast with Nicole Masters at some point talking about bioprimary seed, but um, you know, using um, compost to go in with cover crops, again, we're just like a nano scale, so it's um, easy for us to talk about. but. Um, but anyway, to go in with friends, you know, go in as community with diverse cover crop seeds, um, you know, can they replicate enough and can this small inoculation level really transform landscapes quickly, but, um, but without the pea problems and without, um, without a huge amount of hauling. Just. Can I, I, I just wanted to make a comment on what you said. In terms of actual plant available nitrogen, it's still going to be, even with the loss of ammonia, it's still going to be more effective to apply that slurry than grab carbon from somewhere else and mix it up and make most of the nitrogen in the very, very long-term, slow-release nitrogen that plants won't see in a few decades. 
and there is still organic matter there. It's not. It's true they don't have as much shavings as they do, yes. but you're still adding organic matter when you're doing it. I think. I mean, from my perspective, I agree with what um, Caleb's saying, and we see this a lot. There are some farms that concentrate on using a lot of compost, and they tend to have really high phosphorus. Um, I do think it makes sense to look at this stuff on a landscape scale, and from my perspective, it wouldn't make sense to take a lot of carbon to all of these farms and make a compost that's going to give them less plant available nutrients and a, and a bigger imbalance in terms of their nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. Good to get the agronomist perspective. <laughs> Couple more questions. Yeah, I, would just, I would just add to that that um, uh, yeah, it's um, to make compost on farms at the scale, you know, a much larger scale, uh, is it, pretty impractical. And to bring in a lot of organic material, we tried that. There was the on-farm compost demonstration project that I ran. Um, that was done by UVM Extension and a number, number of organizations back in 1995. And we had three farms. Um, and that was the, that was the, uh, the only farm that it really worked on was a farm that um, did not have a slurry system. They had, um, you know, it was, and even then it was challenging, which is how I discovered the compost covers, because it was still too wet and to bring in organic material. And, and farmers just don't have the time to be making compost on, on that larger scale. Um, so just thought about that. And I'll just very quickly add that you touched on scale. And I think that's another thing that the Composting Association of Vermont, because we also work with farms for on, to support on-farm composting. One of the things we're looking at is multiple smaller scale decentralized management of organic material. And that, so a fix or a solution for a small diversified farm is going to be different than from a very large dairy, yeah. than from, you know, someone that just is, you know, veg and berry but has no, you know, maybe manure or isn't next to someone that they can get manure from to add in. So that's just another thing to be thinking about is that, that not all farms are alike and not all of the solutions are alike. So how can we really have a broad spectrum of tools and systems that can be used in different contexts. Oh, sorry, I had to add my two cents even though I'm the mic runner. Anybody else want to jump in? I think we are leaving with some really good things to think about. We've got um, how to use more compost socks and landscape and, and watershed applications. We've got to figure out how we're going to get USDA and NRCS to understand um, compost as an um, ecosystem payment program, right? Like everybody go home and write your postcard, give your soil sample. Um, you know, we've got uh, and a lot to think about throughout the whole day, of course, um, but I think we've got some good conversation going here. Now you know a little bit more about some of the um, soil health professionals and practitioners and educators in the state. Hopefully you'll connect with them um, for further questions. If you're like me, driving home tonight or maybe 2 o'clock in the morning when I can't sleep, I'll have that question that I want to ask. Can we contact you guys at 2 in the morning? <laughs> I did have someone send me a text at about 4.30 this morning. I was like, first of all, why are you up? And second of all, why? I don't want to be up. So um, with that said, we are running a little bit over. Thanks incredibly to Natasha for this entire day. Again, it goes all week, right? This is our opportunity to be together, be real people, not avatars or blank screens with funny names on them. So the program goes all week. Go to the website, participate, send questions. Um, yeah, let's go eat some pig. So I have a couple housekeeping. Oh, hang on, here we go. But before that, thank you to all of our family.